Hello, and welcome to the first uh, in my two lecture series on nicotine. Now for most of these two lectures, I'm going to be focusing on nicotine from tobacco consumed in the form of smoked cigarettes, because this is the most popular way that people get the drug nicotine. But before we get into the details, let's just step back and acknowledge that nicotine, again, especially in the form of cigarettes, has a lot of different associations. It's associated with sophistication, it's associated with rebellion or being cool or stepping outside of what's norm, uh, normative for your society. It's associated with work and with stress, often as a way of coping with these problems. It's associated with addiction or dependence. And it's of course associated with disease and with death. Nicotine in cigarettes is a source of great profits for the producers of this drug and great profits for the governments which tax and regulate this drug. The point is when we look at a drug like nicotine in the form of smoked cigarettes we see a really complicated picture and this is arguably true for most of the drugs that we're going to talk about in this class. I said way back in I think my first or second lecture that uh, we should resist the urge to oversimplify the picture. And that's certainly the case when we look at nicotine in tobacco. Humanity has a very long history with this drug and that history extends even into the present day and it's full of twists and turns and interesting facets that deserve our attention. I'll try and highlight some of that interesting stuff in this lecture and in the following one. Now this lecture will focus mostly on history and I'll give you a little bit of the natural and social history of nicotine in the tobacco plant, focusing at least on how Europeans and Americans use this drug. And I'll finish off by talking about some of the health concerns or when we first became aware of some of the health problems associated with this drug and uh, with some of the more recent attempts to regulate and control the use of the drug. So in terms of history, the history begins, as it does for many drugs, with a plant. That plant is the Nicotania tobacco plant, or more just commonly called the tobacco plant. As you probably know, it's native to the Americas. As you might know, it contains several, or actually more than several, some interesting different alkaloids. Um, I mentioned alkaloids in my last lecture on caffeine, so just to recall, Alkaloids are molecules that contain nitrogen and have pharmacologically interesting effects on animals, including humans. And for the purposes of, uh, of nicotine uh, in, in humans, these are mostly stimulant effects. And we'll talk about some of those effects a little bit more in the next lecture. Now the history um, of this plant, the social history of the use of this plant dates back for a very long amount of time. Uh, we have uh, archeological um, evidence that Native American peoples used uh, tobacco probably for religious and ceremonial purposes, much as some of them still do today, dating back thousands of years. A term that's sometimes applied to drugs which are used for religious purposes is an ethiogen, a drug which again has some sort of a uh, role to play in religious ceremonies. And to be clear, Native American peoples didn't only and always use tobacco for um, religious purposes, but it seems to be that it was woven into the fabric of their religious life as well as other aspects of their ceremonial life. And indeed that continues uh, to today for some of the Native American peoples in this country. Europeans first came in contact with tobacco during the Spanish conquest of the Caribbean in the 1400s and 1500s. Columbus himself discovered tobacco or was given tobacco by the natives of Hispaniola when he landed there in 1492. And after conquering that island, um, he brought tobacco back to Europe with him, um, where there was some interest in the plant, but it was difficult to grow in Europe. So at least for a period of time, um, you know, not a lot was done with tobacco, um, although that changed as European countries began to conquer and exploit more and more of the Americas, especially areas where tobacco could easily be grown. Now, Europeans um, throughout the centuries have had some medicinal uses for tobacco, but tobacco fairly quickly transitioned from medicinal, uh, from a medicinal product uh, to a recreational uh, drug 
fairly quickly. And uh, during the 1500s and later, and indeed up until this past century, tobacco, of course, has been a very popular um, substance to use, nicotine in it, a very addictive drug. And if we focus on Europe during this time period, and again, sort of skating over a very long period of time from roughly the 16th to the 18th century, we find some interesting bits of history, including the fact that concerns about the dangers of tobacco use, which we think of nowadays, are not entirely new. Um, a number of people, including among them James I, King of England, uh, during the 1500s and into the 1600s, actually wrote kind of a polemical tract about um, the dangers of tobacco discouraging people from using tobacco because he thought it was related to disease and also he thought that it was habit forming. He was right, of course, on both of those counts. Um, however, he and his government had difficulty in prohibiting tobacco, uh, that is to say in stopping people from using tobacco by making it illegal. So ultimately they settled on trying to regulate the use of tobacco by raising taxes on it and collecting uh, revenue from its trade and its sale. Um, this of course was valuable uh, both in terms of controlling the use of the drug, but also in terms of raising an enormous amount of money for the government. And it's interesting to note that a number of different other countries, including the Vatican, Turkey, Russia, other countries, at different points during this time period, made similar attempts to outlaw tobacco use uh, for either religious purposes or for perceived uh, or perceived in real health purposes. It's also interesting to note that some of these attempts at prohibition were backed up with very severe punishments. In some of these countries you could face imprisonment, mutilation, or even death for using or selling tobacco. Um, but despite these very strict laws, at least in some of these countries, there was uh, very little success in actually prohibiting the use of tobacco. And in countries where tobacco prohibition was attempted, some of the familiar problems which we associate with the illegality of drugs uh, appeared. So problems like crime, especially smuggling in tobacco, which has a very long history, and also the adulteration of tobacco, mixing in uh, quantities of tobacco with other non-tobacco products to increase the total um, volume and increase the profits for the drug smugglers and the drug dealers. kind of shift our attention a little bit over to the Americas during this period. Um, the uh, people who were uh, coming to the Americas, coming to the colonies in, in North America from uh, England, um, wanted to grow tobacco, but had a problem in that Spain controlled most of the land in the southern part of uh, the colonies, or you know, what is now, of course, the southern portion of the United States and then the Caribbean. Spain controlled most of that area where tobacco could easily be grown and had not exactly a monopoly, but a near monopoly on the production of tobacco, a very valuable source of income for the Spanish uh, government. Um, as we saw a little bit with tea and with coffee, those monopolies were broken down by smugglers. In this case, a fellow named John Rolfe, who smuggled tobacco out of Spanish-controlled Bermuda and brought it to the Jamestown uh, colonies in Virginia. Now in colonial America, tobacco was a very valuable commodity um, uh, because it could be um, grown fairly easily and harvested fairly easily. It could be packed up and shipped back to Europe relatively easily and could command a, uh, a high price, at least for most of the history of its trade. It's a, it was a pretty valuable thing to trade in. And so if you were establishing um, a farm in uh, the colonies, you might want to grow tobacco because you could make a lot of money doing it and you could repay the debts that you might owe uh, in terms of traveling to and setting up shop in, uh, in the new world. Um, there are some unintended uh, consequences of, of this expand in, uh, expansion of the drug trade, including expanded demand for land that could be used for planting tobacco, which led to some conflicts with Native American people. So as Jamestown, for instance, expand, um, more and more forests were cut down to create fields where tobacco could be grown. That led to conflicts with Native American peoples who lived in those areas. And there was also increased demand for labor to farm and to uh, all these fields and to process the tobacco that was harvested there. Um, in the early days of the tobacco uh, trade, uh, some of this labor was accomplished with indentured servants, people who would be brought over to uh, the colonies under contract and would have to serve for a period of time before being granted their freedom. But uh, quickly and unfortunately uh, for many, many people involved, um, 
the labor supply shifted very quickly to slavery. People, of course, who were not under contract and were uh, indentured essentially in, per in perpetuity. People who had no rights uh, to control their own destiny, or at least very, very little. So um, when we think about slavery, you know, this sort of horrible legacy of American history, some of that uh, legacy is tied up in the production of a drug, the drug being uh, tobacco, or, or rather nicotine within the tobacco. Here is a, uh, <clears throat> an artist's uh, pencil uh, and color sketch of a tobacco plantation during that time period. You can see slaves here processing uh, the tobacco so that it can be shipped. And here are some tags that a slave would wear to identify who owned him. And so it, the picture is not great, but if you squint your eyes, you can see uh, pressed into the metal is the um, the name, the Travis Plantation, in looks like uh, 1826 uh, in Virginia, and you can see that this is a tag or a set of tags that would be uh, applied to the collar of a male tobacco negro property of the Travis Plantation. So again, one of um, America's really dark legacies um, was a legacy that was tied up in the production of a drug. It's also interesting to note that up to the Revolutionary War period, tobacco played a role as well. Um, you know, one of the reasons for going to war uh, was concerns about regulation of the tobacco trade. You know, many of the growers who came to the Americas and tried to set up shop and tried to grow tobacco um, had to go into debt, at least initially, to do so. You know, they had to borrow money for the travel expenses, borrow money to buy land, borrow money to buy equipment, borrow money to buy slaves, etc., etc. A lot of this debt was owned by English banks at very unfavorable rates, and people who were farmers grew very um, uh, resentful and concerned about those uh, about the about those debts. Uh, people, including our, uh, some of our founding fathers, like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Another problem related to this was that England taxed the trade in tobacco, which created um, resentment and concern among colonists. So we're familiar with the idea of taxes being a, a reason for the Revolutionary War and the phrase, no taxation without representation. Well, some of that taxation had to do with things like tea, another drug, which I mentioned in the last lecture, and a lot of it had to do with tobacco. It's also interesting to note that tobacco financed some of the Revolutionary War. Uh, tobacco was used as collateral for loans that the colonies took out with France to uh, fund their war effort. And once the war was won, America taxed their own tobacco to repay war debts. So you could almost imagine if you were a tobacco farmer, um, you went from paying one set of taxes to one government to paying another set of taxes to another as the history of the world rolled on. Um, there were, of course, other reasons for the Revolutionary War, and this period of history, like most periods of history, I'm sure, has its own complications. Uh, I'm not a deep historian of this time, but I do think, and I have evidence, uh, which I'll link to online, to suggest that tobacco played a role. And I think it's just important to reflect upon this fact. Nowadays, if you say the phrase, or words like drugs, or the phrase like war on drugs, or drugs trade, it's very easy to imagine that these things apply to other countries elsewhere, like the drugs trade in New Mexico, or in Mexico, and smugglers, and, and the war on drugs, you know, to stop heroin coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, this is true. I mean, the drugs trade is a worldwide um, enterprise. Um, however, the drugs trade occurs here in America, and it has occurred here in America for hundreds of years. Just maybe not the drugs that we currently think of now as being the ones that we're most concerned about. Anyway, the important ideas I'd like to get to here is that tobacco has a long history, and that's true of really many or almost all of the drugs that we're going to talk about in this class. Um, it's also worth noting, uh, if you haven't already caught this, that tobacco uh, was and is a valuable commodity. If you can control the trade in tobacco, you can make an enormous amount of money. Um, however, attempts to control that trade, at least attempts that are too tight, you know, to the point of prohibition or steep taxation have been problematic in all sorts of different ways throughout history. That's an idea that I think you see again and again when you look at the history of different drugs. Um, controlling drug supplies can make you a lot of money. Controlling drug supplies can also be problematic or difficult to do. Okay, so moving forward a little bit in history, let's sort of flip our attention over to Europe and briefly um, note 
to uh, Germans, a physician and a chemist, who were responsible for isolating nicotine, the alkaloid, from the tobacco plant. Now I'll return to this idea in later lectures, but it's just an interesting thing to note that in the latter part of the 1800s and up into the early 1900s, chemistry uh, as a science was really kind of coming into its own, coming into the form that we're now familiar uh, with. And the technology and uh, the, uh, the science to uh, break down natural compounds and isolate different chemicals really you know, gained in leaps and bounds during that time period. And a number of different chemists and pharmacologists, many of them Germans, interestingly, were able to go out into the natural world, find plants like tobacco, like the coca plant, like um, you know, uh, like the ephedra plant, for instance, instance, and isolate the active chemicals in those plants. In this case, isolating nicotine uh, from tobacco. Now, in my next lecture, I'll talk more about the specific chemistry of nicotine and how it interacts with the human nervous system. But first, for now, just suffice it to say that it was at this time period that science first really began to understand a lot about how tobacco has some of the effects that it has. That is through the um, influence of nicotine. Now during this time period, people used tobacco in different ways. They would uh, sniff a fine powder of it called snuff, which is not exactly the same as the snuff you buy nowadays. I think sometimes people will buy or talk about snuff as a pouch of stuff, which you can um, purchase from like a gas station or a tobacco shop and you stick in your mouth, under your tongue or between your jaw. Uh, your you know, jawline and your cheek. Um, that's snuff as we know it now. Back in the day, snuff was a finely ground powder that people would snort, kind of like cocaine. Um, people, especially in America, chewed tobacco, and people around the world uh, smoked cigars. Um, a thing to note about these different methods of administration is they use more or less the same roots. They depend upon uh, the drug product, in this case the ground up tobacco leaf, coming into contact with membranes in the sinus passages, in the mouth, and in the, sort of the upper part of the throat, and the drug, nicotine, diffusing across those membranes and entering the bloodstream. Um, it may be the case, it probably was the case, that some people smoked cigars by drawing the smoke down into their lungs, um, but I suspect that cigar smokers then, as now, for the most part, drew the smoke into their mouth, sort of tasting the flavor of the tobacco smoke and also kind of allowing for some of the nicotine to get into their system that way, more so than inhaling the smoke. So different methods, but a common, roughly at least, route of administration. Um, now some people did roll cigarettes, um, but the popularity of cigarettes as a way of using tobacco um, really had to wait until another thing that happened at roughly the same time period and that was the development and the patenting by a fellow named John Bonsack in 1881 of the tobacco uh, cigarette rolling machine. Um, for the first time, it was easy to mass produce cigarettes, which obviously, if you just look at one, use a relatively smaller amount of tobacco than a cigar, but because of the way they burn and because of just the size of them, they're easier to inhale. So it's easier to inhale the smoke of a cigarette uh, than it is to inhale the smoke of a cigar. And I think um, if you've ever smoked cigarettes and cigars, you know that to be true. Uh, back in college, I used to smoke cigarettes and, and later on in life, I smoked cigars a little bit. And it is hard to smoke a cigar into your lungs. It's relatively easy once you get the hang of it to smoke a cigarette down into your lungs. Um, this made cigarettes popular because of course you could get a quick nicotine boost without having to use as much tobacco and invest in as much of the cost as to buy a cigar or buy a pouch of chewing tobacco. And the, um, the price of you know, uh, cigarettes, relatively speaking, went down because they could be mass produced and the popularity of them went up because they were cheap and they gave you that powerful nicotine effect. So kind of an important idea here is the way that science and technology changed the way people used a drug. Uh, one, by isolating or you know, identifying and isolating nicotine, um, scientists were better able to understand how tobacco works. And indeed, later on in history, I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, a great deal of science went into manipulating levels of nicotine in cigarettes and other tobacco products. Another change in technology was the development through industrialization of mass-produced drugs, mass-produced cheap 
drugs, in this case, cheap cigarettes. Um, and also, you know, relatedly, a new way of using the drug. Um, again, not that no one ever smoked cigarettes before the rolling machine, or that no one ever smoked into their lungs the smoke of cigars, but suffice it to say that after about 1881, it became a lot easier to draw nicotine into your lungs and get the effect that way, or draw tobacco smoke into your lungs and get the nicotine effect that way. We had essentially a new way of getting the drug into the body. And we'll see this again when we look at other drugs, the way that as history rolls on, science and technology provide new ways of using a drug, which, you know, in some cases, I suppose, can be beneficial. In other cases, uh, not so beneficial. In the case of tobacco, uh, not beneficial much at all. At least if we accept beneficial to those people who make cig cigarettes and made a lot of money doing it. So cigarettes were becoming more popular in the uh, 19th century. If we skip ahead to the 20th century in Europe and America, uh, tobacco popularity, especially in cigarettes, really took off. And this has to do with a couple different reasons. Um, one of them was the use of tobacco by soldiers, especially cigarettes, by soldiers during the war years, during World War I and World War II, and indeed later on uh, in the history of military conflicts in the 20th and indeed in the 21st century. Um, cigarettes were given to soldiers as part of their rations by many countries, including uh, Euro uh, European countries and America for much of the 20th century. Here you can see a picture of some war rations given on Christmas to British soldiers. You can see a pack of cigarettes a uh, packet of tobacco, a tin, and a, uh, a Christmas card, which when you really think about it is tremendously sad. Um, uh, you know, war is terrible. Here's some drugs to help you cope with the stress, and here's a Christmas card so that you can remember Christmas while you're fighting in the trenches in 1914 in Europe somewhere, and you'll probably die. Uh, Ugh, sad to even think about. But this was part of the history, and drugs, uh, or and the drug, um, nicotine in the form of tobacco became popular because generations of young people who went to war used the drug to cope with stress and came back addicted to the drug. And we can see that if we look at surveys um, across history, and this is relatively recent data, but the trends are essentially the same now as they ever were, which is that veterans people who are involved in the military service tend to use tobacco products, including and especially smoking cigarettes at higher rates than people uh, who are not veterans or not associated with the military. And that occurs where, when we look at different age groups reflecting different conflicts, whether those are relatively recent conflicts like uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan or more distant conflicts like Vietnam, Korea. And indeed, if we were to run this back in time, we'd see very similar patterns for World War I and World War II. So the war, uh, wars in the 20th century and the use of tobacco as a way of coping with stress and the, uh, the way that tobacco was provided for free or for cheap to soldiers massively increased the popularity of tobacco, especially of cigarettes. Another interesting change that occurred during the 20th century was the increase in kind of um, independence and indeed in the rights of women in Europe and in America. So during the 20th century, women gained an enormous amount of, uh, of sort of autonomy and independence and rights to vote and were better able to sort of have the lives that they wanted. And this is, of course, in many ways just wonderful, but it had, or at least associated with it, some problems, one of which was that smoking was taken up by women uh, in the 20th century as a way of signaling their independence and, uh, you know, signaling how fashionable they were, as, you know, men did as well, but, you know, as, as women became uh, more independent, they became a new market for cigarettes. Um, women also took up smoking cigarettes because nicotine is a fairly effective appetite suppressant. And, um, you know, women and men too, but maybe especially women because of sexism are, are uh, encouraged to have very slim figures and to uh, not eat and smoking tobacco and getting the effects of nicotine are one way to help yourself do that. So we can see if we look at artwork from the early part of the 20th century, you know, here is a, a print called Where There's Smoke, There's Fire by the American artist Russell, Russell Patterson, which um, depicts a fashionable woman from the 1920s uh, smoking a very long, uh, well, a cigarette in a very long cigarette holder. 
Here we can see a photograph and I actually couldn't track down who the photographer was for this photograph or, or what the name of the photograph is, but it's clearly a kind of a satirical uh, sort of presentation of changing gender roles during the early part of the 20th century. We see a man here doing uh, the washing work, wearing an apron, something that historically women uh, were forced to do, and a woman dressed as a man wearing trousers and knickerbockers and a hat, smoking a cigarette and kind of watching over um, the man to make sure he does what he's supposed to in a role that clearly was historically what men were allowed to do or what men were supposed to do. So changing gender roles um, in many ways, of course, good, or at least you know, the increased independence of women is, is a good thing. I think most sensible people would agree, but it created some problems in the sense that women began to pick up a habit which before this time, earlier on in history, was much more associated with men, and thus they became uh, new users of tobacco and faced and continue to face some of the problems that everyone has with tobacco, including dependence, uh, disease, and death. Look at ads from a little bit later in history. I think most of these ads are from the 1930s and 40s, although I actually don't have my notes here for their exact dates. You can see that cigarette brands like Lucky Strikes were sold to women and to men as well as being ways to keep fit. You can have a slender figure. Um, you can lose weight if you smoke cigarettes. Um, of course, this is a something which has its own set of problems, especially if you're trying to be healthy. Smoking is probably one of the last things you should consider doing. But it was a uh, part of an effective advertising campaign that was mounted by Lucky Strikes and by other cigarette companies during this period. Indeed, in the 20th century, as um, sales of tobacco, especially sales of cigarettes increased, there was really intense competition among cigarette producers and among the advertising companies that they hired to market their products to control or to at least be the dominant players in the market for uh, tobacco sales, to be dominant in this drugs trade, this legal drugs trade. Um, this is during a time period when advertising, as we currently are familiar with it, you know, posters, magazine ads, ultimately radio and television advertisement, that all was kind of growing up during this very same time period in the early to mid 20th century. So the kind of the rise of modern advertising was bound up with or tangled up with the expansion of use of tobacco, especially of cigarettes. And so during this time period, you, you can see a lot of really interesting ads for tobacco products, especially cigarettes. Um, for instance, we have ads from the time period um, encouraging people to smoke because of uh, the perceived healthiness of smoking. You know, the idea is your doctor smokes cigarettes, um, so you should smoke them as well. There are ads from this time period, uh, Chesterfield cigarettes ran ads where they tried to encourage people to smoke because there is scientific evidence for the benefits of smoking or for the superiority of uh, Chesterfield cigarettes. And there also were just quite frankly some really weird ad from, ads from this time period where people like Santa or your children would encourage you to smoke because they wanted you to, I suppose. It's really those baby pictures are cute but weird. Gee, mommy, you sure enjoy your Marlboros. Uh, it's kind of sad when you think about it too much. Anyway, the important idea here is that kind of as technology and science changed the way drugs were uh, used, uh, media or the rise of what we think of as modern media, modern advertising, especially advertising for women, changed the way people used a drug or at least increased the popularity of using uh, a drug. Uh, nicotine in the form of tobacco, especially smoked tobacco and cigarettes. It's maybe worth stepping back for a second and asking, well, why is it that advertising works at all? You know, what is it about advertising for cigarettes or really for anything else that makes people want to use a product or ultimately want to buy a product? Um, I think most of us take for granted that advertising works because of course we're surrounded by it and probably we're susceptible to it. But uh, again, it's worth thinking about for just a second. The answer to the question is complicated, but just to highlight a few uh, concepts that we've talked about previously in this class. One is classical conditioning, you know, good old associations between a particular stimulus, like in this case, the brand of a cigarette or the image of a cigarette or the image of someone smoking a cigarette and other stimuli, which are unconditioned rewards for people. So all of us, by virtue of being, uh, you know, being 
animals, by being primates, by being humans, uh, enjoy things like socializing with others. We enjoy being socially successful and, and kind of dominant in whatever our endeavors are. And we all enjoy sex in one way or the other. So by merely associating um, anything, in this case cigarettes, with those things, we create a kind of a, a relationship between the stimuli such that the presentation of a cigarette triggers motivation uh, for use. You know, merely seeing an ad for Lucky Strikes or seeing a cigarette makes you on some level feel motivated to move towards that thing, move towards that stimulus because it has these positive associations. Like Pavlov's dogs, you begin to salivate even when the bell is rung without having to actually be presented with opportunities for socialization or success or sex. Another concept that we've talked about before is operant conditioning. And this is where we make associations between stimuli and particular types of outcomes. So associations that can be made in advertising between a particular um, stimulus like a cigarette or brand of cigarettes or a type of behavior like smoking cigarettes and various outcomes, including uh, increased chances of positive uh, outcomes of rewards and decreased chances of negative outcomes. So if you smoke, you'll feel uh, successful or happy. Um, that's positive for most people. If you smoke, you'll feel less stress, less uh, social anxiety. You'll you know have less weight gain. That's taking away punishments or taking away negative associations. Um, similar to classical conditioning, the idea is if we just repeatedly pair uh, one stimulus with, in this case, outcomes, we can trigger motivation for use. You know, merely presenting the stimulus will encourage people to use it because they want some of those rewards they want, or they want to avoid some of those punishments. And a basic you know, tenet of all advertising is just frequency of exposure. If we bombard people with magazine advertisements or television advertisements or billboards or nowadays, of course, internet advertisements, the more and more we do it, the stronger and stronger those associations can get. Also, targeted exposure, another kind of basic tenet of advertising. If we focus our exposure um, or our, our sort of the, if we focus these, the presentation of these associations to people who are vulnerable to them, we can maximize the chances that those people will pick up the associations and feel the motivation to use, uh, to buy and to use the product. So if we look at modern research on tobacco advertisements, we see that there's plenty of reason to believe that folks who are vulnerable for some reason or another, you know, like adolescents who are maybe uh, just coming into their own socially and might feel particularly socially anxious, women who might be um, especially anxious about their weight or their body shape because of sexism, um, people who are undergoing stress and might be you know, troubled by that stress, you know, for instance, combat veterans or minorities, people who uh, may feel, um, you know, stress or threat or just general anxiety because of the prejudices of society. All of these groups are prime candidates for exposure to advertising. And throughout the long period of the 20th century, a lot of advertising was focused on people within these groups because they're particularly apt to pick up those associations between you know, the stimulus or the behavior, you know, pack of cigarettes, smoking the cigarettes, and the outcomes, like being successful, being uh, happy, being thin, being able to cope with stress, or whatever. All of this leads me to what I think of as just kind of an interesting idea, and it comes up a lot when we think about drugs. And the idea is that we like to think of ourselves as autonomous. We like to think that the choices we make come from our own free will. You know, the type of clothes we wear, the type of food we eat, um, you know, that what we do on, in our day-to-day -day lives. It seems obvious that these are uh, these decisions are just products of our own mind, and really. You know, I get to choose what I want to do with my life. Um, in some strict sense, this probably isn't true because our choices really are shaped by our environment. Um, I don't know if I go as far as to say that this challenges the whole idea of free will, although I know some philosophers and scientists would go that far. But suffice it to say that your decisions to use a drug, in this case, to take up the habit of smoking or not, aren't 
cannot be or are not entirely down to just your free will in some sort of pure and isolated sense. Those decisions are influenced by the environment that you're in, by the person that you are, and by the type of exposure that you've had to images of smoking, especially images in media. Um, thus, you know, your decision to smoke or not smoke is shaped by the environment, and you may not even entirely recognize or understand it. Um, one of the benefits, I suppose, of studying in psychology is to get a little bit more awareness about this and be, hopefully, a little bit more of a critical thinker about how this stuff works. Anyway, to, to move on a bit in history, we're now well into the 20th century, and throughout most of the 20th century, use of tobacco increased, especially up through about the first half of the 20th century. Around the 1950s, a, a trio of articles came out in journals, um, medical journals, that is, in uh, Europe and in America, uh, highlighting some of the risks associated with tobacco use, especially risks for cancer and other serious illness. Not that there was no awareness of this stuff before then, but some of the first really good research to document and you know, make, uh, make the claim or support the claim for the connection between smoking and illness came out during this time period. <clears throat> And then in 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General released a very, um, very famous report that publicized these risks and cited some of this research. And after about the mid-1960s, tobacco use in general started to decline and has been declining ever since then. It served the high watermark for a uh, maximum number of people smoking was really about the early 1960s. And as people became more aware of the risks associated with uh, using tobacco, especially smoking tobacco, um, they adjusted their behavior accordingly. In response to some of these health concerns, uh, manufacturers of tobacco products, especially cigarettes, responded by changing their products and by uh, adapting or using, uh, or at least claiming to use technology to make cigarettes uh, safer. So for instance, filtered cigarettes, you know, nowadays if you buy cigarettes, most of them include a, uh, a kind of a, um, paper pulp filter at the end of them. You've probably seen this before. Um, these really do nothing to uh, truly reduce the risk of the smoke that you're drawing into your lungs, but they give the perception to the user that smoking is somehow a little bit safer. Like it's somehow a little bit safer to smoke a filtered cigarette than an unfiltered cigarette. Uh, again, there's no evidence to suggest that this works, but it creates in the mind of the user an impression that tobacco is somehow, or that, that cigarettes are somehow uh, safer. Interestingly, during the same time period that tobacco um, cigarette manufacturers were kind of trying to spruce up their image and present themselves as healthier than they really were, they were also tinkering with the chemistry of tobacco to make it stronger, to increase the nicotine levels in tobacco, thus to ensure that more people would stay addicted. You know, as people were starting to quit using because they'd heard about the health risks of tobacco, tobacco companies, cigarette companies, tried to hold on to the smokers as best they could by keeping more of them addicted. So like I said, um, tobacco filters really do little um, or nothing essentially to make smoking safer. Um, plenty of smoke still gets into your lungs if you use a filtered cigarette. They actually also increase the profits for cigarette makers because you use less tobacco per cigarette if you use filters. So it helps to make money for the people who are making the cigarettes. Light cigarettes, or what used to be called light cigarettes, were developed during the same time period. If you ever smoked cigarettes or smoked light cigarettes, you may know that these are basically milder blends of tobacco or blends that taste milder to the user. They often are manufactured in such a way that the cigarette tube has little uh, holes punched in it so that more air is drawn in as you smoke each puff of the cigarette. It makes the smoke feel lighter in your mouth. Although there's evidence that people who smoke light cigarettes just smoke more frequently. So they take more puffs, they take deeper puffs than do people who use uh, non-light or regular branded cigarettes. So again, no real health or, or safety benefit, but just the appearance of, uh, of a somehow a safer product. And much more recently in history, uh, some of this kind of uh, the shenanigans uh, on the part of 
uh, tobacco companies of tinkering with nicotine levels uh, were documented by the Harvard School of Public Health, this is back in 2007, where they looked at nicotine levels um, across the late 1990s and into the early 2000s and showed that during that time period, um, so advertised mild and medium cigarettes um, had massive increases in nicotine. You know, nicotine was really ramped up in those products during that time period, presumably to help keep people addicted so that uh, tobacco companies could still maintain their profits. Um, other changes during that time period, again, we see the influence of science and technology. Um, there's a lot of uh, really clever chemistry that went into the manufacturing of tobacco or the processing of tobacco for cigarettes during the you know, sort of second half of the 20th century, including, um, for instance, the use of ammonia, which acts as kind of like a freebasing agent for nicotine, essentially making nicotine more available to the lungs more quickly, helping it absorb into the tissues of the lungs faster and helping people to have a stronger and more addictive, at least for many people, effect of nicotine. Another interesting example of the way the manufacturing and processing of tobacco has changed over the years in ways that have made uh, cigarettes more addictive is the use of menthol as an ingredient in many cigarettes, or at least mentholated cigarettes. Uh, for those of you who've ever smoked menthols, you're familiar with how this works, but for those of you who aren't, menthol is uh, the compound which is in a lot of uh, mint flavored gum or uh, lozenges or things that you probably are familiar with. It can be added to tobacco in cigarettes and cigars and has the effect of giving you a cool sensation in your mouth as you're inhaling the hot smoke of the tobacco. It doesn't actually change the temperature of your mouth. It, the menthol actually just activates receptors in your tongue and in your throat, which signal to your brain uh, a sensation like being cool, like if you're sort of um, having ice cream or a cold beverage, although of course it's not literally cooling your mouth down. Now, the effect of this um, is interesting because it allows people who smoke menthol cigarettes to inhale more deeply uh, the smoke than people who are uh, smoking non-mentholated cigarettes. So research that has been done looking at the lung um, volume of people who are smoking regular cigarettes and smoking menthol cigarettes consistently finds that the people who are smoking mentholated cigarettes are drawing in more smoke, they're getting more nicotine as a result, um, and they're also getting more of the other um, stuff in smoke, the various tar compounds which can be uh, dangerous to the lungs and other parts of the body. Um, it's also interesting to note that menthol may actually interact with the metabolism of nicotine, um, inhibiting that metabolism so that the nicotine stays around longer in your body. There's some evidence of this, which would suggest that if you're smoking mentholated cigarettes or using other mentholated tobacco products, you're slowing down uh, the biotransformation of nicotine in your body. Nicotine can stay active in your body longer, and you can have a greater risk for being addicted to nicotine and addicted to uh, uh, the products that are supplying it to you, like your cigarettes. Another interesting uh, side of the story of mentholated cigarettes is that mentholated cigarettes are are very uh, much preferred by African American smokers. The majority of African American cigarette smokers smoke mentholated cigarettes. Only a minority of cigarette smokers from other racial or ethnic groups do. Um, this uh, has some consequences, uh, including that uh, people who are uh, smoking mentholated cigarettes, including African Americans who are doing that, may smoke fewer cigarettes overall, but can have actually higher risk for cancer and other adverse outcomes of smoking. Um, this may be because although they're smoking fewer numbers of cigarettes, they're drawing the smoke from each cigarette uh, more deeply into their lungs and um, you know, their lungs are absorbing more of the carcinogenic compounds in that smoke. Um, it's also uh, generally true that folks who are African American uh, tend to have slower metabolism for nicotine anyway than people who are white or you know, Caucasian in terms of their ethnicity. So these are folks who may already be at a somewhat higher risk for having a strong and you know, sort of longer lasting nicotine effect, maybe more likely to become addicted anyway. Um, the choice of mentholated cigarettes may exacerbate that problem, further elevating the risk for addiction to nicotine and nicotine products, including um, uh, cigarettes and maybe especially mentholated cigarettes. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, mentholated cigarettes are heavily advertised uh, to African American uh, to African American communities and uh, African American 
um, you know, predominantly African American um, art uh, um, art forms like in hip hop uh, tours. You often see hip hop tours and R and B music tours and festivals are promoted by brands like Cool and others. So. Um, you know, this this uh, increased risk for addiction has been uh, exploited by the manufacturers of tobacco products, especially cigarettes, to keep more people addicted to cigarettes for longer. And unfortunately, it extracts a uh, really uh, terrible uh, consequence on the populations involved. You know, African American folks who are smoking being at greater risk for suffering uh, from cancer and other negative health outcomes as, rela as related to their smoking. Okay, so that last slide was a little bit garbled. It, it uh, I kind of tripped over myself a bit. But, um, you know, as I was suggesting, um, African American smokers tend to smoke menthols. Um, they tend to have higher levels of uh, nicotine uh, in their system uh, than non mentholated smokers. This can be due to the tobacco blends, it can be due to the deeper smoking of the mentholated smoke, or to um, changes in the metabolism of nicotine such that nicotine sticks around in your body longer if you're smoking mentholated cigarettes or to the fact that uh, African Americans tend to have slower metabolism for nicotine. Um, however it works out, this greater um, sort of lasting effect for nicotine does seem to be associated with greater difficulty in quitting, so greater addiction or dependence on the drug, and greater risk for relapsing even after you have quit. So as I've been trying to describe in the last few slides, in the sort of tail end of the 20th century, the, uh, the concerns about some of the health risks associated with smoking cigarettes uh, really um, came to the fore and were more uh, widely um, known in society. And that led to a series of lawsuits that ultimately were combined and settled under a landmark uh, settlement in 1998. Um, where uh, major manufacturers of cigarettes settled lawsuits that were brought by a variety of plaintiffs um, to the tune of about 250-ish billion dollars to be spent out in settlement costs over the next 24 years, and another 250, well, 240 million dollars to be spent out over the next 10 years after 1998 to uh, go to fund research to reduce smoking among young people. Um, this was, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when this was major news, and it is interesting to note that um, uh, this was an enormous amount of money back in the 1990s. It still is an enormous amount of money, and in some ways highlights the enormous amount of money that tobacco companies have to be able to spend out in terms of penalties um, as a result of legal action. It's also worth noting that a lot of this money um, that it was originally sort of earmarked or, or dedicated to being spent on treatment or on research or on prevention for tobacco uh, related uh, problems has not in fact gone to those ends. Um, the states, which are the major recipients of these uh, payments, often use this money just to plug holes in their state budgets or um, they'll sell uh, futures based on, or they'll sell uh, bonds based on future tobacco revenue. Um, a criticism that has been made of the tobacco settlement in you know the past couple decades is that although a lot of money was set aside or promised, I should say, to fund some noble efforts. A lot of this money ended up being used for just typical government spending, which is to say, maybe not as efficiently as we might like. Now, tobacco companies who, who agreed to pay out this money, of course, paid some of it or were able to pay some of it based on the amount of money that they had in terms of their assets. But a lot of this money was, um, a lot of the costs for tobacco companies were offset by raising costs for um, purchasers of tobacco products, especially for cigarettes. Um, that, and in addition, uh, states have been steadily raising uh, the taxes on um, tobacco over the last you know, couple decades. So if you look here on this graph, it's a, it's a few years old. It goes back to 2008. It was in the New York Times. And you can see that just in the last uh, about decade or so, um, the cost of purchasing a pack of, cigarette has gone, have, of cigarettes has gone up quite significantly. And interestingly, this increase in cost has coincided with a general decrease um, in smoking. So last time, uh, not last time, I suppose it was one of the earlier lectures, we talked about patterns in use of different drugs and trends such that, you know, during certain periods of time, drug use has tended to increase and during some periods of time, drug use has tended to decrease. 
tobacco is an example, or cigarettes especially, is an example of a pattern of drug use which has generally been declining for the past half century or slightly more now. And as best as we can understand, the reason for that decline has had to do with a greater perception of risk associated with this behavior and a greater cost associated with this behavior. You know, people don't always make rational decisions about their drug use, but they often do, and they often you know, will modify their drug use or even stop using drugs, even drugs as addictive as nicotine in cigarettes, um, based on their perception of how risky the behavior is, based on uh, the perception or the reality of how costly that behavior is. Um, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, I used to smoke back in college, uh, back in the 1990s, and I quit. I was never a very heavy smoker, but I quit largely because I couldn't ignore the fact that it was a dangerous behavior for me in terms of my health, and it was just frankly expensive. So perhaps I'm an example of someone who changed his behaviors in part because of my sense of risk and my sense of cost. Now, more recently in history, um, this is in 2009, there's been additional uh, efforts to regulate tobacco on a federal level. The Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act was signed uh, by President Obama in 2009. Um, it allowed the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, to regulate to the tobacco industry. Before this time, the FDA really had little power to regulate uh, tobacco uh, and to regulate cigarettes, but laws were changed and now the FDA can. And then along with this increased over oversight uh, that the FDA is able to have over tobacco products and how they're manufactured. Um, there's some additional provisions in the act um, where uh, tobacco companies needed to seek approval from the government to sell new products. They had to stop using or at least seek approval to use labels like light, mild, and low. You recall earlier I described how um, in the 20th century tobacco uh, manufacturers used these types of words to suggest to consumers that these that the products they were buying were somehow safer to use like you know i don't smoke regular cigarettes i smoke light cigarettes or i smoke mild or low low tar cigarettes um, in all cases in the past these uh you know this type of labeling was essentially an elaborate lie the tobacco wasn't particularly lighter or safer than any other p tobacco products and um, the 2009 family um, Smoking Prevention Tobacco Control Act allows the FDA to kind of regulate the use of these types of labels. Also to ban uh, flavorings of tobacco in cigarettes, except for menthol, which was given an exemption, and except for flavorings in cigars and, and uh, non-cigarette tobacco products. So if you go to a tobacco shop nowadays, um, you know, for instance, if I was to go to a tobacco shop or just a gas station and look for the cigarettes I used to smoke, I used to smoke uh, Marlboro Lights. They're now called something different. They're not called Marlboro Lights anymore, and I actually don't know uh, what they are called because that term, light, is no longer um, allowed to be applied to those cigarettes. And you can't find flavored cigarettes the way you used to be able to find them, except for mentholated cigarettes, and you can find still flavored um, cigars of various sorts. Although, um, as recently as just a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to uh, news from North Dakota, and um, I remember hearing, just a, uh, I should have followed up on it, um, some state legislation that was looking at regulating um, the use of flavored tobacco products because of concerns that these tobacco products are more appealing to children. You know, children might want to smoke or use a product that uh, has a fruit flavor or a chocolate flavor or vanilla flavor um, as compared to just regular tobacco flavor. Other uh, provisions in the uh, smoke, uh, Family Smoking Prevention Act, uh, limits on advertising, um, especially advertising that was designed to attract younger smokers. Recall that younger people are uh, more vulnerable for picking up a variety of different habits and uh, advertising has been targeted uh, to them over the years from tobacco companies to sort of attract them to smoking and lock them in as uh, users. As, uh, you know, research suggests that people who begin uh, drug habits including cigarette smoking at an early age tend to maintain those habits over long periods of time. Um, which is valuable to tobacco companies and, and dangerous to those folks involved. So uh, limits on the advertising that can be done for, for cigarettes, especially uh, advertising that's uh, designed to attract younger smokers. And um, the requirement of new warning labels on the front and rear of each uh, pack of cigarettes. So um, now again, if you were to go to a tobacco store or a gas station or anywhere that you could purchase cigarettes, you see fairly large uh, warning labels on tobacco. Uh, 
tobacco um, on, on cigarettes, and those are new as of 2009. So we've covered a, a number of important ideas here. Um, I think the real thing to focus on here is that uh, in the latter part of the 20th century, especially in um, recent decades up into the 21st century, there have been increasing concerns about the health and safety of using uh, tobacco, especially smoking uh, tobacco cigarettes. And this has been related to a decline in the use of these products, so a decline in the use of, of nicotine, the drug from in these, in these ways or in these products. Um, and these concerns about safety have been the inspiration for regulation and control of the drug. It's interesting to reflect upon, um, upon the different efforts that go the government has made over the decades to control tobacco, because of course tobacco is a, it's a dangerous drug, it's an addictive drug, it's a legal drug though, and you can see that it's difficult to make a drug entirely illegal, but it can also be difficult to have a legal drug, finding you know, legislatively the right spot where there's enough regulation to, to sort of um, discourage use, at least discourage use by new users, and to um, encourage, uh, if possible, safe use of a drug but um, not so much regulation as to trample upon people's you know, individual liberties and also to lead to some of the unintended consequences of regulation uh, like smuggling and crime. Anyway, uh, that's about all for this lecture. It's been a fairly long lecture and there certainly were some times I was stumbling. So um, uh, if you've made it this far, my, uh, my thanks for your patience and attention. Uh, next time round, I'm going to be talking a little bit about current trends in tobacco use, especially trends in cigarette use. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the acute and chronic effects of nicotine in the body and talk a little bit about treatment for nicotine uh, addiction. Well, that's all for now. And as, as, I, as I often say, uh, thanks for your attention. Um, step back from the computer or the tablet you know, find a place to relax and let this all sink in. Um, don't smoke a cigarette uh, if you can possibly avoid it. It's a nice way to relax, but it's dangerous for your body. It's addictive. And we'll talk about a little bit uh, more about that in the next lecture. So thanks very much. Bye-bye.